So, guten Abend. So, good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd also like to welcome our guests. I'll be introducing them in a moment. The Open Forum of Davos takes place every year, as you know. Uh, this is the eighth time the Open Forum has taken place. It's organized by the Federation of Swiss Evangelical Churches and the World Economic Forum. The issue this evening is a world without nuclear weapons. Is it utopia? As you know, President Obama and Medvedev have reached an agreement or agree that they need to reduce nuclear weapons. The negotiations have almost come to a conclusion, we've heard. But elsewhere in the world, uh, it's not a question of disarmament, but rather armament. North Korea, India, China, Pakistan, of course, Iran as well. Uh, Iran may well soon have its own nuclear weapon. And tomorrow, perhaps, a, terroristic, a terror group such as Al-Qaeda. So how is it possible to reach a world without nuclear weapons? How and when? This is going to be our topic for this evening and then you will have the opportunity to put your questions. So with us this evening, we have Mr. Karl Theodor Freiherr zu Gutenberg, who is the Defence Minister of the Federal Republic of Germany. He's been in his office since October last year. He was Minister for Economy and Technology before that, and General Secretary of the CSU. And I should also say that he's the youngest defense minister of Germany, probably. Gareth Evans. Evans was foreign minister of Australia. He's co-chair of the Commission of Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. Ms. Salpi Weiderud. Yeah. Ms. Alpi Weiderud, she is private consultant, a private consultant in peace and security issue. Please. <laughs> and Mr. Segal from Pakistan, he is chairman of the Pathfinder G4S. Uh, Mr. Segal has a very long career and a different life. He's a, a very famous columnist, editorial columnist in many newspapers. He's on TV too. Uh, he was a director of a bank and he's a permanent uh, member of the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much. Also, vielleicht habe ich eine. So, perhaps then my first question, uh, quite a simple one. Perhaps to Mr. to Gutenberg. What's your personal view on nuclear weapons? What's your personal position? Ah, and that's an easy question. My personal view um, is something that I think everybody feels that we would like to see a world without nuclear weapons. It's something that I feel very deeply and something that uh, has to be pursued with political ends. But it's going to be a rocky road. It's going to be complicated to achieve that. And certainly at points along that road, there will be disappointment. It's more complex than some people believe. And it will be difficult to say, at uh, this date, at some time, we will not have uh, nuclear weapons in the world because the balance between proliferation and the uh, existing arsenals has to be recognized. Do you think that the situation today is more dangerous than, say, 10 years ago? Well, perhaps we could look back um, to 1989, 1990, where the world was bipolar, almost symmetrical, and today we have asymmetrical threats. I often say that the only thing you can rely on today is the fact that we cannot predict anything. 
Now, it's difficult to say, given that, that it's, things have become more dangerous. What's changed is it's difficult to follow the thread of nuclear weapons. Uh, quite often you don't see proliferation happening. You're presented with a fait accompli. Evans, we have, there are currently nine states uh, that have nuclear weapon in the world, officially. If you include North Korea, which we don't yeah. like to, but <laughs> eight others, yes. And uh, we have more than 23,000 nuclear warheads in the world. Uh, is uh, the situation very dangerous? What do you mean? It's very dangerous indeed. Those 23,000 warheads between them have the destructive capability equivalent to 150,000 Hiroshima bombs. And that is a capacity obviously able to destroy all life on this planet many times over. But there's many fewer than those weapons are needed to have that result. As few as 30, 40, 50 weapons in a, some kind of serious nuclear exchange would also have devastating impact on the planet. And that still leaves 22,975 to go. It's sheer luck, sheer dumb luck, not a result of good management, not as a result of good political leadership, that we have not had so far a nuclear catastrophe since the end of the Second World War, a nuclear explosion, deliberate. The problem of miscalculation, the problem of accident is huge. We're learning over and over again just how close we came on a number of occasions during the Cold War years to a catastrophe of this kind. A member of my commission, William Perry, the US former Defense Secretary, uh, told us of at least three experiences that he was involved in when he was a senior scientist in the Defense Department, when he was awoken by the commanders in the middle of the night saying, our radar screens are showing 200 Russian ICBMs, intercontinental missiles, coming onto our screen. We think it's a computer glitch, but we're not sure. Can you get in here and find out? Uh, and, you know, we had, we had 20 minutes to make a decision, because that's the, the delivery time for these weapons, 20 minutes or less to make a decision as to whether to respond or not. And this stuff happened over and over again. And these days, with due respect to my Pakistani colleague, we don't have command and control systems of the sophistication and intensity that existed as between Russia and the United States. And, of course, we face the, the prospect in, in, in some of the countries that have nuclear weapons now. And we face the prospect of even more players coming into the game. So if we think we can be complacent, if we think that the status quo can just continue, we are seriously, seriously wrong. And this is an issue, even though the world has sort of gone to sleep on this since the end of the Cold War, particularly for the last 10 years, it's absolutely critical that we now capture this momentum, which does exist with President Obama coming to office and with a completely different view about this to his predecessors, President Medvedev from Russia showing some signs of being responsive. It's critical that we pick up the momentum and take it from there. I agree with uh, Dr. Gutenberg that this is a very long and complicated process, but we can talk about how complicated mm -hmm. later on. The main thing is to be absolutely clear in our mind that we must have a world without nuclear weapons. But can I just say three more sentences because I think the... Uh, just the one question. Is it uh, President Obama? We heard uh, the, the President Obama in, uh, it was in Prague last April. And he say, we want a world without nuclear weapon. Can we hope that um, Obama is, uh, will do something, will be successful or? <laughs> I've been to Washington many times, including in preparing this big report, which has just come out, spoken to all the senior people there, including the vice president and a lot of other senior players. And all of them are absolutely persuaded that Obama is personally totally committed, totally sincere about this, and totally passionate about it. There's quite a big argument going on in Washington at the moment about what they call the nuclear posture review, which in the past has just been a sort of a rubber stamp thing coming out of the Pentagon. And this has been sent back and back and back, and there's a big debate that will continue mm -hmm. for probably another two months before we see it, in which one of the issues is what nuclear weapons are for. And what President Obama wants to say is that so long as we have any nuclear weapons at all, the only purpose for which the US should keep them 
and have them available for use is dealing with nuclear threat contingencies, not the existing doctrine, which is a real issue for NATO countries. The existing doctrine, the American doctrine, is strategic ambiguity. We mm. keep open the option of using nuclear weapons even for non-nuclear threat con contingencies. <coughs> the politics of all this are very difficult in the United States, as they are in many countries. <coughs> but the short answer to your question is Obama is serious, and I think he will deliver to the extent he possibly politically can. Obama is serious. I, I would like to ask the same question to Herzog Gutenberg. Uh, <coughs> Russia and USA possess 95% of the nuclear weapon on the world. Uh, are they really the right country to say uh, we have to stop it? <laughs> Should I answer in English or in German? I think... As you want, perhaps in German for the... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm excited. Ich glaube, dass... Well, I think the USA and Russia can really set a very important example, send a very important message, which can have a huge impact. Having said that, we're in a situation, as has just been said, where other countries are striving towards nuclear weapons. And uh, countries who ha have said uh, we are committed to disarmament uh, under the CTBT, etc., etc. So it's very complicated. But if we're talking about Russia and America, it constitutes about 22,000 warheads, which leaves a thousand. Uh, unaccounted for, and I think that that's still a, a huge amount. I to ask you, your, your position, you represent here the civil society. Uh, what is the, the role of the civil society on this issue? Well, quite complicated, but I think without a deep, broad, collective, um, sustained civil society push, I don't see governments uh, moving forward in general. Right now, civil society is seeing that there is hope out there with President Obama, with the different um, events that are coming this spring, MPT Review, Munich, Washington, D.C. We have a lot of guidance from um, the evans Gawaguchi report that we have right now and other reports that have come out the U.N. Secretary General has. But the civil society feels that at this stage we need to move to a clear goal and what they're pushing for is an international convention to ban nuclear weapons. We were able to manage that with a mine ban, uh, with a mine ban treaty. Um, and it was a collective action with like-minded governments working together and to say that there is a hope and there is a vision, but we can do it. But what kind of action? What kind? Right now, you see a lot of different... Um, there's the traditional new NGOs that work on nuclear issues. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working for the World Council of Churches, and churches have um, both... The, churches as well as the fellowship of churches, the World Council of Churches and different um, community, communions of churches have always from the beginning called for um, the abolition of nuclear weapons. They've called it a sin against um, uh, God, a crime against humanity. Um, they're organized groups. Mm -hmm. They are there who have structures, who can work with people, who can move forward. The question is how to work together and not to keep them in different compartmentalized ways, but to move together in a concerted manner right now. And I think um, we need to see a, a wider coalition. We need to see youth, women, and others who come together, and they are concerned. But unfortunately, even on the nuclear agenda, it has never been a top priority. So it had to, and this is the time, because um, <laughs> it's very, it's, it's fragile. You know, governments can change their mm -hmm. views very, uh, if there is no concerted push from the people. After all, politics is something very local, and local people should get involved. So you think it's a, a top priority. Garrett Evans, uh, so we say the situation is very dangerous, as you said. Who should have today the, the, the possibility to say we stop it? Global zero, like mm. uh, Kissinger said uh, 20 years ago. Well, in terms of achieving disarmament, getting rid of those 23,000 weapons, the initial responsibility is that of the US and Russia between them, as we've seen, 22,000 weapons. And it's crucial that we see not only a quick conclusion of the bilateral treaty they are negotiating right now, but also a continuation of that into further stages over and over again in the next 10, 15 years to get right down to much smaller numbers, if not to absolute zero in that time frame, much smaller numbers. Then there's a responsibility for the other six nuclear armed states and of course the 
the outlier case of North Korea. China has something over 200 nuclear weapons. It won't tell us how many. The French have 300, the Brits about 160, the Israelis probably a couple of hundred, although they don't own up to having any at all. And India and Pakistan, they also keep things reasonably quiet, but we believe there's at least 60 or 70 nuclear weapons in each of those. And Ikram Seagull might want to comment on that. And they've got a responsibility to come into this too. We can't just leave it all to Russia and the United States. And we have to commence a serious process, although it's going to take a long time, of getting them involved in multilateral discussion. But then we've got the responsibility of ensuring that nobody else joins the ranks of the nuclear armed countries. And that's a much broader responsibility. It's not just on Iran and those countries that are perhaps poised to go down that path, and we'll maybe talk about Iran later on. But it's the responsibility of the whole international community to agree on strategies and pressures and sanctions and disciplines under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and outside it that will make life very, very difficult to impossible for anyone who wants to go down that path. And that's a universal responsibility. And the trade-off is, I'm afraid, pretty evident in the politics of this. If we are going to get that consensus from the world at large and from many countries without nuclear weapons to really, really cooperate on the non-proliferation side, we've got to get the big guys, the existing nuclear armed states, getting serious and visibly serious about disarmament. So if you ask me to prioritise the responsibility, I say the primary responsibility is the existing nuclear armed states, the secondary responsibility is the whole international community, and then the third layer of responsibility, as has been said, is civil society to keep governments honest, mm -hmm. to keep them moving in this direction, intergovernmental organisations, because without political pressure coming up from below, from citizens, as this country knows better than most, politicians don't like doing very much at all. Mr. Evans, this is a beautiful world. All the community have to, to, to do that. But uh, what could bring uh, Iran, North Korea, China, or Pakistan? We will well, <laughs> tell Mr. Segan to cooperate. Well, I'm happy to talk about this all night, but why don't you ask, why don't you ask Iskram Siegel? He's a, he's a Pakistani. He's, he's got some responsibilities here. I will give the, the floor to you, Mr. Segal. You are from the uh, country, Pat Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is not a member huh, of the, the nuclear treaty, non-proliferation treaty, but it's, a nuclear, uh, it's in the club, of nuclear club. Um, wh what do you think about what, uh, what was uh, said from Mr. Evans? Well, um, before I answer your question, you left one of my careers out, and that was that as I was an army officer, an infantry soldier, and I fought two wars with India. And uh, to answer, to give a short answer to that, I agree with uh, what uh, both uh, the Honorable Defense Minister and Garrett and, and the lady is saying. We need to uh, disarm. Uh, we do not need a country, we do not need a world with nuclear weapons, where the threat of nuclear weapons uh, poses a, a threat of extension of the whole human race. And naturally, uh, when we look at each other, when we look at what this world has achieved, we do not want to give it away, maybe even by accident. You know, maybe like uh, Garrett was saying, uh, you know, 200 uh, ICBMs heading their way, and then somebody takes a decision that uh, may be a wrong decision to launch an attack. Now the question is, uh, if it were to concern Pakistan only, then I would say to you that you were threat, felt uh, threatened enough by Iraq uh, to go to war with Iraq. You were felt threatened enough by Iran now to have a whole this thing. Why didn't you feel threatened by Pakistan up till now? Because Pakistan's nuclear response was specific. It was as a response to India building a nuclear mine. Uh, Pakistan has been attacked uh, twice by war. We fought three wars with India, two of which I have fought in. And obviously, India has a conventional army which is four to five times larger than that of Pakistan. And Pakistan's only defense left when N India went nuclear was to have a nuclear response. Why doesn't Iran feel threatened by us? Why doesn't Afghanistan or Kyrgyzstan or China or Bangladesh or anybody else in the vicinity feel threatened by us? Now, having said that, I now realize that the world does feel threatened by the fact that we have nuclear weapons. 
And that is why, because there's now a nexus, possible nexus between terrorism and nuclear weapons. Now, in that respect, I hold the world responsible for keeping us out into the nuclear cold. We have a situation where we have an enemy, a declared enemy that has attacked us three times. You mean India? India. Now, obviously, we have to defend ourselves. Switzerland is a we neutral, clear weapon? New, new, uh, Switzerland is a, a neutral country. Why does it have an armed forces to defend itself? Obviously, if they have nuclear weapons, we have to have a similar response. But you, by keeping us out into the nuclear cold, you are putting us into the black market. Now, the black market is a two-way street. When you go into the black market and you go and try and get access to nuclear material or nuclear fuel, then you have to give away something. And obviously, there's a nexus ter of terrorism. Now, that is a strong case for bringing Pakistan out of the nuclear cold, giving, making Pakistan responsible for, for its activities. Gareth has talked about command and control. What uh, command and control can we have when we have no access to that technology? Obviously, you keep us out into the nuclear cold. We have the nuclear weapons. We have the nuclear uh, uh, means to deliver them. And yet, the world did not feel threatened because that, because before that, because they knew, like Iran or, or, or Iraq, unlike them, they knew that it was mm -hmm. India specific. But that, that is why I ask you that there is a reason for Pakistan to come in, to be, bring Pakistan out of the nuclear cold, and make Pakistan responsible for its actions. Mm -hmm. Will you speak after about the black market? It's a very dangerous situation. Are you, you are writing now a book uh, about this is is issue. We will speak about that later. But I have another question. I have another question. We still have this issue about why some countries have the right to have nuclear weapons and others don't. For example, today, Pakistan, Israel probably and not Iran, not North Korea. What's your view? Well, you have to discriminate very clearly uh, who is subject to a monitoring regime, who is subject to treaties, um, who is following a certain kind of logical process. And you need to distinguish clearly between uh, who's doing what. The description that we had is one of a sort of fatalistic logic um, saying at the time we have a possibility of international law uh, which needs to be applied. That brings us on to the debate regarding Iran, uh, which is very complicated. But allow me to touch upon one other issue of the global zero approach because I think that the questions we have to ask is that can we do it? Does it make sense? And will we do it? There are few countries uh, which would see themselves as being under the nuclear umbrella of a country, um, maybe Japan, Taiwan, uh, Turkey. What would happen with those if Russia and the USA disarm completely? Do you then have to say, uh, we then have to do away with our nuclear umbrella, and on the other side have countries that are not prepared to disarm? So I'll just give you that example because I need to emphasize that it is perhaps more complicated than uh, just following Barack Obama's um, determination to, to disarm. So one has to take into account all of the possibilities. Well, it is complicated, but not that complicated. <laughs> yeah, the, um, it's complicated, <laughs> but it's very dangerous, so we have to... <laughs> I mean, the, fir the first thing is the something. notion that there's any states have a right to retain nuclear weapons indefinitely in perpetuity is simply unsustainable. Now, the minister's perfectly right that there are five states that are legally entitled to have weapons mm -hmm. at the moment under international treaty law, the United States, Russia, um, Britain, France, and China and the others are outlaws in the sense that they've just gone ahead and grabbed them. That's perfectly true. But that particular treaty also says that those existing 
legal nuclear weapon states have an obligation to move towards disarmament. And to the extent that they're not seriously exercising that obligation, then they themselves arguably are in breach of the treaty and the pressure has to be kept on them. But it's more than just a legal pressure, it's a moral pressure. Mm -hmm. What really gets up other people's nose all around the world and certainly got up the Indian and Pakistanis and Israelis' nose was the notion that there are certain countries that were sort of born to have their particular security anxieties protected by nuclear weapons, but others were not entitled to have their existential security anxieties equally so met. And people, all the world hates double standards, and it's just very difficult to sustain a position if you keep on insisting on that distinction. And so that's what we've got to break through and get equally serious commitment to disarmament. Now, what about the achievability of disarmament? I agree that you are not going to get to zero any time soon. What we argue for in this report is a two-stage process. Can we see the book? What is the, the book that you... The, the, the book I'm waving around is this great big <laughs> thick report that has just been, just been published. It's available on the internet, and I've got copies if people want them. Uh, which I can send to you, but it's available on the internet, www.icnnd.org, in all its glory. It's a 330-page report of the International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, which is an Australia and Japan-initiated exercise more than a year ago, but had on it, I mean, Klaus Naumann, the German general, Bill Perry, the former British Defence Secretary, Gru Brundtland, the former Norwegian Prime Minister, former Mexican President, the father of the Indian bomb, Brajesh uh, Mishra, Shirley Williams from the UK, very distinguished group of international statespersons who came to this issue with many different perspectives. But it's a joint Australia-Japan initiated exercise and what it offers is a blueprint for how to do all these things. And what we say, to be as quick as I can, is that we are advocating a two-phase process. First of all, minimisation and then secondly, elimination. And what we say is the minimisation stage we can set a target date for. And we've set one, mm -hmm. 2025. And what we say is that by 2025, we can and should get to no more than 2,000 weapons in the world as a whole, a 90% plus reduction on where we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. Plenty of NGOs and people say, that's not good enough, we've got to do better than that, sooner than that. But frankly, in the present environment, if we can get to that sort of level as quickly as that, we'll be doing very well indeed. Then what we say about getting to zero, we just get there as fast as we can. No point in trying to set a date on it, it would be lacking in credibility to do so. Why? Yeah. Because there are geopolitical issues, there are psychological issues, there are problems of enforcement, there are problems of verification, which we know are nightmarishly difficult. But yeah. they're all achievable. And the main thing, last word, is to try to change the mindset, yes. to get away from this military logic that states are always going to be wanting to shoot each other up. You're going to have to have deterrence, deterrence capability of one kind or another, and then you have the argument about whether you can do it with nuclear weapons only or whether you can do it with conventional means. But, you know, if we're going to solve this problem, the world has got to be a rather different place when it comes to conflict resolution and Kashmir and all these issues that have made life so impossible. You're very for optimistic. Pakistan. But we can talk about how to do it. But just let me finish on that note. I'd like to talk about alliance relationships and extended deterrence. The issue was opened up by the Minister, but we can come back to that. But just let me finish on one tiny little note of optimism <coughs> about the magnitude of this task. People don't realise it, but since the end of the Cold War, ordinary conflicts, both across borders and within borders, have dramatically declined. There's been an 80% reduction in the number of major conflicts defined by a 1,000 or more people being killed in a year. An 80% 80, 80 reduction also <coughs> in the number of, of, battle, of people dying uh, in that situation. <coughs> There's a whole variety of reasons for that, but the main reason is since the Cold War, we've just got a hell of a lot better at conflict resolution, through negotiation, through the role of the UN and other regional organisations in peacekeeping, peace building, and there is reason to believe that we're not just inevitably stuck with a world determined to tear itself apart. We can do better and we've got to keep that momentum going. And this will look a lot more realistic if that process can continue. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Miss uh, Sapi, what, what have you to, to... I think there were two words that were coming to my mind as I was listening to the eminent gentleman, and that's the dichotomy between fear and facts. If we get the facts, 
then we're empowered to be able to act. If we live under the fear and under the absurdity that nuclear weapons give us security, then we want to own more. If he has it, then I want it. If he's powerful and he's being rewarded because he has weapons, he's, sit, he's sit, still sitting on the permanent five of the Security Council, why shouldn't I? So he's rewarded, I want to. I'm a mother now and I can see what cause and effect does. So, first of all, we have to be clear and say, nuclear weapons do not give us security. On the contrary, their sheer existence, even if they don't blow up, they make us insecure. Then it's the question of facts. If we know what we're talking about, I mean, there are reports like this out there and people need to read them. They may be a bit too sophisticated for some, but there are ways, there are people that are available, they're going around talking and they're available not only to statesmen, but they're also available to a simple NGO person working, committed on all sorts of issues. So we need to have facts, facts, facts. We have to share information and we need to understand that the title of this thing, it's not, it's a utopian vision, but we can make it a feasible reality and stop this thing that if we own it, we can, more. I, I respect uh, Mr. Evans that there are the achievable goals. We are hoping for 2020 convention. <laughs> They want to minimize. It's a, it's a very <laughs> optimistic re reason. I want to give you the, the floor. But first, Mr. Evans, you organized, uh, it was last uh, September in Cairo, the meeting between mm. Iran and Israel, secret meeting, but <laughs> we heard about that. Uh, <laughs> so you have a country, Israel, was supposed to, to have the nuclear weapon. Huh? It's not uh, probably certain. You have another. Iran, uh, we, we, doesn't, we don't accept the, the <coughs> nuclear program. How can the negotiation continue? <laughs> the press reports of that meeting were much exaggerated. Do you uh, think so? <laughs> what happened was, in the course of our consultations all around the world, <coughs> we convened a meeting off the record um, in Cairo of all the regional countries, the Arab League countries and Iran and Israel. And they all came. There were 20, 25 of them represented at both government and um, civil society research institution level. And what we were debating, among other things, was the achievability of a regional weapons of mass destruction or nuclear weapons free zone. This is an extremely relevant issue in the context of the forthcoming non-proliferation treaty review conference for complicated historical reasons I won't go into but basically the developing world has made movement forward on this regional zone issue a condition of support for continuing the treaty. So we were exploring ways of solving that particular problem, getting some forward movement. Very difficult as you say when the Israelis won't even admit to having any weapons at all but there are ways of discussing this. You can talk about having safeguarded facilities or not and you know, what would be needed to get the Israelis to agree to having safeguarded facilities. Mm -hmm. It's a double talk. Everyone knows it's a double talk, but you can still talk. And so the discussion went backwards and forwards across the room. It got rather heated from time to time with some of the participants, as you can imagine. But we came away, those of us organizing all this, with a feeling that it just might be possible within the next year or so for the UN Secretary General to bring together again himself a meeting of the regional parties to discuss what the preconditions would be for a weapons of mass destruction free zone, what the prerequisites for it would be. Far too early to think in terms of a negotiation, that's not going to happen until Israel for one is much more confident about its security situation. But I think we can move forward on that issue. There's a lot more to say on the Iran issue, but maybe we can come back mm. to that. Yeah, we, we can speak about the Iran issue because it's a very interesting and we speak a lot about Iran. Uh, if you like to... Uh, uh, to I, I just try to recall the discussion about preconditions with Iran for yeah. the last couple of years and how, our, how hard it is to, to, to really get to any consensus about preconditions already, about the preconditions of preconditions and other things. So we have gone through... We've, we've walked quite a path here, and and just uh, it, and I, I sh I'd, li I'd love to share your optimism, but... <laughs> well, can I just say a word or two about Iran, yeah. because in my previous role as president of the International Crisis Group for the last 10 years since I left politics, I've been working on that issue pretty consistent in Iran, in Iran. Iran and visiting Tehran and talking to many, many mm. diplomats. My belief, in short, about this issue is this, and I hope I'm not being naive. One, the Iranians are not going to 
return to a world in which they are not making any nuclear material at all. This enrichment issue, fabrication, they're not going to do it. And part of the problem with all the negotiations up until very recently <coughs> is there's been an insistence that the Iranians commit to going back to zero enrichment. Too much pride, too much politics, too much everything for that to happen. So what we've got to aim at <coughs> is getting the thing whereby you don't cross the red line that really matters, moving from capability to produce a weapon to actually producing a weapon. That's the red line that really, really matters. As long as you've just got capability, you can technically be within the legality of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Although every... If you're not... Lisa, just but, this but let question, me, yeah. yeah? Why am I optimistic that there is a, an agreement potentially negotiable of that kind, whereby the Iranians stop short of weaponizing and allow in inspectors to give us confidence that they're serious about that. The whole variety of reasons, but very, very quickly. One is I think they do fear that they might get zapped by the Israelis if they do actually acquire weapons. They think they can probably stare that down between now and then before they actually do weaponize because there's too much anxiety about the implications. Number two, uh, they do feel that the slack, the rope that the Russians and the Chinese have given them, tapping them with a feather in the Security Council, that will run out, that kind of tacit support uh, if they weaponize. Thirdly, they fear <coughs> that um, the other major countries in the region, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, will just not tolerate a nuclear-armed Shiite Persian state. And they basically, I think, have made the judgment that they can get all the political gains they want, thumbing their nose at the West, demonstrating technological capability, acquiring a bit of chest-thumping stature in the region without actually acquiring a weapon. And we should, as an international community, be prepared to negotiate on the assumption that that outcome is possible for that reason. That's very tough, that. very tough for the Europeans. Germans know a lot more about this than do anybody do else you because you've been doing it. Very optimistic version. <laughs> well, I would love to share it. As I've said, I'd, I'd love to share it, and I would share it if. Um, I didn't feel that this red line um, was constantly being shifted backwards. I would also share the hope if we had a clear indication that at this juncture in time um, there were clearly a civilly use, useful approach which would at the same time allow a bit of chest beating. But that actual point has long been left behind. The last offer, um, f uh, the extended hand from an American president, um, was, was not accepted. Indeed, it was knocked away. And it's difficult to see enrichment as a part of this. And then there, was, there, was, there were requirements from the International Atomic Energy Agency, these were also refused, rejected out of hand. So I think that unfortunately we have to conclude that the Iranians want to go further than peaceful civil use. The Americans are saying that the Iranians are only two or three years away from an atom bomb. Well, we've heard all kinds of projections over the last uh, few years. I've not joined this discussion, uh, but they are at a very advanced stage. I think what's right is to um, search a regional solution. We want to avoid an arms race in the region. And then it wouldn't be linked to or just limited to one individual country. Um, and what might happen if Iran got a weapon is that maybe uh, Saudi Arabia would try for one and Turkey would feel that it had to have one as well and so it would continue. Friedlich zu verhindern, das will ich auch. Yeah. Uh, uh, President Obama said freedom, peace through strength. What kind of strength can be applied? Uh, sanctions, military means? Well, that's why I think it's important to use the word peaceful. 
Um, it is a last resort. Uh, is a, a military means uh, would simply run the risk of turning the whole area into a war zone. I think we need to apply peaceful means in Iran. The negotiations there are important, but uh, sanctions would require some kind of dual track approach. Uh, so, so, so there become kind of incentives for full compliance, and at the same time, sanctions for um, what isn't uh, what what isn't met. But I think that sanctions have their limits. However, a military solution, I believe, is the least possible desirable of all uh, steps, and it should be avoided. We say in Iran. Uh? Iran. I mean, I feel with um, Gareth Evans and um, the minister, I should, they're the experts willing with, but I would feel with Iran, they're a proud people. And um, I'm of Armenian origin, and um, we have very different cultures the way we talk to each other. Sometimes we say one thing, but we really mean something else. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Um, it's a bit well, difficult, <laughs> right? I'm married to a Swede, so I know what it's like <laughs> to communicate. But um, I think with Iran, we need to focus on transparency and full disclosure. Um, if the, yes, not only on what they tell us, on what, but what they also don't say, what they're doing. It. But um, isn't it true that the religious leaders in Iran, the supreme leader has said that, um, has called the fatwa against uh, production of nuclear weapons? I mean, isn't there a way that maybe um, there could be also involvement with the religious leadership there. I don't know if that, that experience has happened. Um, Mr. Evans? Well, just uh, on that last point about the fatwa. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's fatwas and fatwas <laughs> in the Arab world, and maybe this is not a very serious one. But I've actually been quite impressed in a funny kind of way by the sincerity of those Iranians who've said that you know, Allah to. doesn't like weapons of mass destruction, and frankly, we've never been in that business. Remember that they did not acquire chemical weapons in response to being attacked by chemical weapons uh, by Iraq during that awful Iraq-Iran war. And they say that there were religious constraints stopping them doing that. And I've had little guys, whiskery guys, with their chests panting with gas aftermath attack, being very, very passionate about the horrors of any weapons of mass destruction, saying, never, 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 will we ever do it? Now, you can discount all of that. And I didn't even mention it among my list of reasons for a degree of optimism that they won't actually weaponize. But it's a factor, and we ought to bear that in mind. But I just want to make one more point. Why was it that, that on the face of it, perfectly reasonable offer uh, was rejected just before Christmas? Because this was a way through. It didn't attack head on the Iranians' right to enrich uranium. It gave everyone breathing space. This complicated deal, but basically Pick to take internationally the enriched material they did already have, to turn it into the kind of fuel that could be used in a research reactor, peaceful purposes, give it back to Iran. Mm. The p domestic politics of the explanation for why that happened, not in America this time, but in, uh, but in Iran, uh, Ahmedi Najad actually supported the deal. And a lot of the people around him that everybody gets hysterical about supported the deal. I don't think it was very loved by the revolutionary guards out there on his left, and that was certainly a factor. But the real reason that deal fell through was all the good guys who we think won the last election and who we think of as the democratic standard bearers, Mousavi and all the rest of them, they were fierce in their criticism of Amiri Najad for even thinking about accepting this deal. This was selling out the national interest. So the, the trouble with the nuclear issue, the pride factor, um, involved in having this capability and steering everybody down um, is making it very, very difficult to get sane and balanced responses. But in the meantime, I'm nervous about what's going on in Iran. I certainly believe the pressure should be maintained. I certainly believe that the Iranians have got a hell of a lot to answer for in terms of their reporting and their dishonesty and lack of transparency in terms of some of the programs they've undoubtedly had in the past. I certainly believe that they're inching significantly closer to actual weapons capability. But I still believe that we should premise our response to all of this not on the assumption that they're hell-bent to acquiring a weapon, let alone using it, but on the assumption that what they're really about is acquiring breakout capability, virtual capability, steering everyone down, winning the political argument, mm -hmm. chest beating. Yeah. I really do think inside, and you de develop some instinct about this stuff when you've been around as long as I have, and I hope I'm not stupidly naive, but my instinct is that's what it's all about. And on that basis, we should be hastening very, very slowly indeed before doing anything rash. 
Uh, just a word about uh, the situation in Iran. After I want to, uh, to speak about Pakistan, I have uh, to go to back. No, 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 no. I'm so sorry. I have no. Well, it's, I just have a feeling uh, which I want to bring into this dialogue. My trust in the reason, reasonable understanding of the Iranians, the common sense of the Iranians, hasn't really grown over the last few years. And I think that there are a number of reasons for that. Um, now, obviously, I'm, some, I'm something somebody who believes in democracy it, it and it's very difficult to accept this kind of approach obviously we want to approach negotiations reasonably we want to approach them with common sense but I think that uh, we might find ourselves finding that our negotiation partner is pursuing other means, has other targets. I would like to speak. You, you, you say you spoke about the black market in your country, the, the particular situation of your country, Pakistan. Um, you told me before that it was a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, you are writing a, a book about this situation. Can you say more? Yes. First of all, I'd like to make a comment that I was, uh, I came to this uh, forum expected to be bombarded as a nuclear country, but I'm very glad that all the exchanges are taking place about Iran and not Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> which shows that, which shows that Pakistan <laughs> is considered a responsible nation. And that is why, you know, uh, when I talk to you about writing the book, the thing is that when you uh, write a book and you copy from one person, it's called copying or plagiarism. But when you copy from many people, it's called research. <laughs> you know, now, basically, in, in doing the research, uh, I came across material which was shocking. Because it was shocking to me because, obviously, uh, not being of the security apparatus and seeing, uh, you know, I realized that to get access to nuclear material and fuel must have been an exercise. But how that exercise went about uh, was fascinating but also shocking because when you go into the black market and you say I have to get technology or I have to get uh, spare parts or I have to get centrifuges or whatever and you may come across uh, some people who will do it only for money but you, like we've had people from Switzerland or Germany or France or Italy or Switzerland. United States uh, do that for us but on the other hand, there are people who say, okay, fine, we'll give you the technology, but you have to give us something back in return. And when you are faced with a situation where you cannot have access to that technology, then you are saying, okay, fine, what do I do? Do I face extinction? Because you do not know that during the last 10 years, India and Pakistan came very close to nuclear war twice. Once after the uh, par Indian parliament was attacked and uh, in 2002 and once in uh, 2008 uh, after the Bombay incident. In both times, the armies were massed on the border and we were threatened by attack. And both times, it was only the fact of our nuclear weapons that stopped them from going to war against us. So that was a deterrent. Now, the first time also the deterrent was that there were a lot of Americans occupying some of our bases, and obviously they didn't want to be attacked by nuclear weapons from India. Now, when you're looking at this black market... I have just one question, excuse me, Mr. Sega. Who can have access to this black market? For, for instance, you have a very strong terrorist movement in, in Pakistan, Al-Qaeda, you have the Taliban very near. Uh, do you think these people can today have an access to the black market, can have uh, access to the nuclear technology very easily? I think it is possible. Um, I'm not going to say about the Taliban, but Al-Qaeda, yes. I think it is possible. 
It's terrific. Uh, it is possible. Uh, they could possibly, uh, you know, because obviously uh, they had the means to go and perform 9/11, right? And uh, you know, obviously uh, they have been there have been a lot of evidence that they tried uh, chemical weapons. What do you think about that? <laughs> Well, it's um, very unsettling. I think there are different uh, assessments of whether Al-Qaeda has access to nuclear material. Many people doubt that is the case. Um, but I think we need to be extremely wary. The information that we have is that they don't have any yet. But it's only a small step, perhaps, and um, the destruction that could result is awful. I want to open the discussion to the public. Uh, is it possible that a terrorist um, movement have today already <coughs> access to the nuclear technology? No, we don't think so. Um, it's not impossible that they could, not least in the Pakistan situation where there is lines of access, arguably through military personnel and so on, because of the long history of, uh, of that country. But no, I think if they had, we'd, we'd know about it by now. Much more, there is a risk, uh, but it's, and it's not a negligible risk, um, of terrorists getting access to bomb-making material and being able to do the, the kind of engineering that's necessary to make a simple Hiroshima-style bomb. It's not impossible at all, but it's a much lower risk than the other terrorist option, very, very simple one, of gaining access to radioactive material of the kind that's used in X-ray machines and many, many industrial as applications and piling that on top of conventional explosives and, and setting it off. And um, although the damage you can do from that physically is nothing like the scale of what you can do with a nuclear explosion properly so called, uh, the psychological impact of that would be phenomenal. Uh, there would be large numbers of deaths. Um, parts of cities would be uninhabitable for significant periods. And I think, and that's so much easier an option for terrorists that uh, it's almost certain that uh, that's the kind of route that they're likely to go down. But you can't discount the possibility. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that we talk about nuclear security and we talk go on being very, very fierce about non-proliferation because the more countries that are in this game and the more enrichment and reprocessing facilities there are, obviously, and in the more countries, the, 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 the risks do mm -hmm. increase quite significantly. Okay. So we see that the, the situation is uh, dangerous, serious, that there is some hope uh, for a, a world without nuclear weapon. I open the discussion. You have now the possibility to... To, to give you a question. Um, vielleicht muss ich darf, uh Do you now have uh, the chance to ask questions? Please state your name and then put your question. Yes? And the microphone is coming right to you. My name is Mr. Hoofer. I'm here with a group from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, um, expressing my own personal view. I don't share your optimism, Mr. Evans, with regard to uh, the ultimate objective of uh, eliminating nuclear weapons, uh, getting them down to zero. I do think they can be considerably reduced, however. These weapons have been in the world since 1945. The powers who possess them don't want to give them up um, because they can't be forced into agreeing. And if they are scared, then they will want to keep their weapons. Is there a realistic objective uh, of getting them down to some minimum level? And those, if you like, illegitimate nuclear powers today become legitimate nuclear power so that the whole thing is brought under control is, if you like, legalized. And around that, um, there will be a more realistic system and relationship around those. Uh, thank you very much. Who's your weapon to? Who's your question to? Um, anybody who feels like they wish to answer? Look, it, it is a realistic objective. And what we're talking about with this minimization process is getting down with the Americans moving from 9,000 warheads down to 500, the Russians moving from 13,000 down to 500, and the other six um, 
established nuclear armed states, having no more than a thousand between them, which is roughly what they probably have at the moment on cautious estimates, but would and would involve uh, them actually freezing any further weapons or having net losses over time to, to compensate for any gains. Um, that's not unrealistic at all, because even on the most um, neurotic Defence Department assessments of what kind of capability they need to deal with any contingency, you can, you can do an awful lot with 500 weapons, and, and, the, and the, the kind of stocks that the other countries have had demonstrate that. Um, in terms of and the psychology of getting there and the politics of getting there are something else again, but I genuinely believe that this is possible and that the, the kind of anxiety that was mentioned earlier on in this debate about allies, uh, Turkey or some of the NATO allies or the Northeast Asians, the Japanese and so on, uh, being very anxious about a diminution of the nuclear umbrella. I think A, those numbers should give nobody cause for alarm at all in terms of defence capability, but more particularly you could move to, which is very important to move quickly, to a doc doctrine that weapons, nuclear weapons are not to be used for non-nuclear threat contingency. You could move to that tomorrow with confidence if you're a Japan or a Korea or a NATO ally yeah. because, yeah. frankly, the capability uh, with conventional weaponry to deal with biological, chemical or any other threat contingency is so great. Uh, it, it's all about mind changing and mindset changing and that the basic story that has got to get out there is these three simple lines. So long as anyone has nuclear weapons, others are going to want them. <laughs> B, so long as any state has nuclear weapons, they're bound one day to be used by accident or miscalculation if not designed. And C, any such use, any such use would be catastrophic. Now that mindset is, I think, beginning to catch hold. There's, there's been a big change in the intellectual debate about all of this since, not actually Obama, two years earlier than Obama, when Kissinger, Schultz, yeah. Nunn and Perry, the, the gang of four, the four US former defence and foreign secretaries, actually signed a famous op-ed, mm. Kissinger of all people for God's sake, saying nuclear weapons, whatever their utility might have been in the Cold War, in but it issue. was 25 might, years might have been. ago, None and we had more the, and more with nuclear weapons. <laughs> no, but what they were saying was, whatever the utility might have been, these days and in any future world that we can envisage, nuclear weapons are far more dangerous, far more risk than any security they can possibly provide. Now, if you get that mindset embedded, it desperately needed American leadership because so long as that wasn't happening, you weren't even getting started on that. If that is followed through with the Obama administration, we're going to see a much, much different uh, approach to these issues than we've seen so far. And I think we can get there. You're right that it's going to be very difficult indeed to get the last stage down to zero. But if you can gather the momentum, you can get a self-fulfilling forward momentum that is, is completely lacking at the moment. Did you want to say anything on that point? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, um, I don't want to be the party pooper, um, but I really share the objective, absolutely. The Gang of Four was referred to, to uh, the new abolitionists. It's almost uh, an irony of history. Th those who were really the um, the enemies of the old abolitionists have become the new abolitionists. There's been a complete turnaround there. And I don't think you should underestimate that sign of hope. And with Obama and his initiatives, there's a chance of reaching a level where a verific verification regime could work far better than it works today. And particularly between the Russians and American uh, we could see a real reduction in uh, nuclear warheads. But now it's time to play or to, to strike a, a more pessimistic tone. The question is, who's going to move first? Who can, can they move at the same time? If so, can that be verified? What is, going, what is the future going to look like? Uh, um, will the alternative lead to less um, civil uh, 
casualties and deaths. So I'm being the devil's advocate a little bit, but these are all uh, factors that need to be taken into account. I don't think our views are very far from one another, but I'm slightly less optimistic in my approach. Uh, you, are, you are a conservative, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'd like to just um, mention here, yeah. one of the sure. real good sketches I saw was, uh, if you remember, Robert McNamara was the defense secretary during the Vietnam War. And there's a Vietnam wall in Washington, which has got the inscriptions of the 55,000 American dead. And two, three years before he died, Robert McNamara said that he had made a mistake in Vietnam. And you have this sketch of this name telling each other, pass it long, McNamara has realized his mistake of all the dead. <laughs> so this is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Hello. Uh, I myself, I'm an engineering student, and I personally believe that uh, using my skills towards the destruction or killing somebody is probably the worst human mistake. So I wonder if Mr. Evans found in his research why the scientists are using their valuable knowledge mm. towards these objectives. Are they using this? Are they creating this or producing this uh, mass weapons destruction for money, for political uh, reasons, religion? Well, That's mm -hmm. question. Thank you for the question. From which country are you? Excuse me. Colombia. Colombia. As an exchange student. Thank you. We want to answer. Well, very briefly, I think the scientists who worked on the original Manhattan bomb project in the United States were obviously torn by huge moral doubts and dilemmas in the context in which they were working in the, towards the end of the Second World War. Those who were responsible for making the decision to drop the bomb on Japan were torn again. And we know about that from the many, many harrowing tales of... Uh, of people who are involved in those debates. And I think, I, I've known, I've, I've met a lot of the scientists who do this sort of stuff, and I don't think very many of them are sort of Dr. Strangeloves who are passionately determined to use these things to, uh, to wreak havoc and destruction. Most of them are well motivated by, to the extent they, they think about the implications of what they're doing, by the belief that acquiring a huge deterrent capability and a mutual deterrent capability will actually be a force for, for peace. What they can't answer is the argument that you just can't be complacent, that you can have that capability without it being used. But, you know, that's, that's a way of dealing with the, the moral dilemmas that are concerned. But I think we, we ought not to be rough on the idea of, of people acquiring um, physics and nuclear engineering capability, not just for civil nuclear purposes, but for military purposes. There are a huge number of tasks that are going to need to be done by highly, highly qualified, capable people in terms of just managing a process of disarmament um, along with the process of armament. I mean, those research laboratories and so on have got to be maintained um, you know, for that kind of purpose, to manage this process. Uh, weapons have got to, you know, have a degree of reliability to give people the comfort that they don't have to have thousands and thousands of, um, of redundancy capabilities built in. That, you know, if you're going to get down to very low numbers, people have got to be very confident those remaining weapons are going to work. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all sorts of, of good reasons that are consistent with what we are trying to achieve uh, mm -hmm. that should not lead one to, you know, be too um, condemnatory of those people who, who get into this game. I think most of the people are acutely conscious of the moral dilemmas that are involved and, and want to do the right thing. <laughs> yes, mister. Uh, so I'm Bruno Marshall from the International School of Geneva and uh, I was wondering if, if uh, if you're not walking, in, if we're not going in some sort of a dead end, because if it's not nuclear weapons, it might be another type of weapon. And obviously, there had always been some countries and some some uh, empires for uh, history that were stronger than others. And are, aren't we walking a bit in a dead end? Because when we're going to stop nuclear weapon, maybe we're going to have a new chemical weapon or a new technological weapon, which is going to be the same problem. And as usual, it's going to be the 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 more uh, white uh, oriented country wh which are going to have mm -hmm. it and the more uh, rich country who are going to have it mm 
So that's mm -hmm. my question. No. You think uh, nuclear weapon can uh, can bring the peace because peace by fear, and uh, if the nuclear weapon weapon disappear, we can have another <laughs> another fear. Also, natürlich ist das eine sehr berechtigte. Well, obviously, you're very justified in asking that question. I think the step of disarming nuclear weapons um, is something that could be extended to weapons of mass destruction on the whole. And there have been real signs of progress on chemical and biological weapons over recent years. And it can take it can take decades to reduce weapon stocks. It's very actually difficult. The technical aspects um, of uh, such disarmament. I think that the possibility of an asymmetrical relation is something we need to take into account. But allow me to refer to the third step of what Gareth Evans was talking about, namely uh, monitoring by civil society. Uh, it's important to be able to bring pressure to bear and provide checks and balances for the political processes. But it's an absolutely legitimate question. You have to believe, however, in uh, it being something positive for humanity and that um, it will be possible to follow the path that has been outlined by Mr. Evans. Yes, I'd just like to add that uh, there's this term called mutually assured destruction, MAD. And that actually is the uh, thing that is uh, keeping the peace between India and Pakistan today. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I just? Mr. Evans? But Sophie, yeah, you, you Mr. first. Sapi. No, you first. I, th I, think, um, I think we need to, have a, to look at a whole question of a comprehensive security. And at the same time, we cannot talk about disarmament without addressing the whole question of militarism head on. We also have to address issues of social justice. And why are people resorting to weapons, be it nuclear weapons, be it conventional weapons or whatever. And the kind of world I would like to live in is if there were no weapons at all, if there were no armies at all. But it's up to us. And I know that would sound extremely naive for some. Do you some. really think it's up to us? <laughs> I think so. I think at the end of the day, Weapons are made by humans, and it's, they can be also destroyed by humans. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a mindset change. We can, I mean, I've worked with churches, what the, the peace churches, who refuse in absolute ways to go to, at the same time, I'm Orthodox, and I have my churches who would say, that, no, we sanctify going to war. So, and we're talking about churches. We see the division within the Christian family, let alone outside in society. So there are those who believe and it will work. And I don't believe that those people who believe that we could live, we could have a world without armies and weapons are naive. They were actually much more bold than those who said that they could go. Can I just say with the utmost kindness, I think that that is an illusion. Um, perhaps a forlorn hope, because we have to recognize what humans can do. We could do that one, but just a couple, of a couple of further answers to what was a very good question. I mean, I think one point that needs to be borne in mind is that nuclear weapons are uniquely inhumane, uniquely indiscriminate, uniquely destructive. It's only nuclear weapons at present that can actually destroy life on this planet. It might be possible sometime in the future that biological weapons would acquire that capability. Certainly they're a hell of a lot more scary than chemical weapons. But it's, it's nuclear weapons that are right up there alongside climate change actually is the one great pol public policy issue, or two great public policy issues that could actually destroy this world as, as we know it. And that's, that's a reason for being particularly obsessive, I think, about nuclear weapons. The second point to make is that the sort of general pessimism of what's the point of doing all this stuff because you can't uninvent weapons and human nature is always going to be wanting to use the most powerful and ugly weapon available and if not nukes maybe it will be biological. I think you, you've got to bear in mind that even though you can't uninvent anything you can outlaw it 
And I think we've been pretty successful as an international community in outlawing chemical weapons. Uh, I was involved in those negotiations with Australia that brought them finally to conclusion, and we solved the problem of verification with the world's nuclear industry. Uh, biological weapons, which the Minister's mentioned, there's equally a convention out there which does outlaw them, and it's got considerable amount of, of buy-in by the whole world, except a few rogue states that you know, we're worried about. The big problem with biological weapons is that of verification, because you can do an awful lot of damage with stuff produced on a laboratory scale, and verification strategies for that are just very different. So it's a real risk, but we ought never to abandon the effort to rid the world at least of the worst categories of weapons, while knowing that we're never going to completely disarm, even though that's a UN objective as well. Do you want to add something? Very shortly, yeah? Wait, wait, you have the microphone. Uh, we just saw the use of chemical weapons during the Israeli war. So I don't think it was a real success, to my eyes. Well, that's still contested, of course. Um, and there's always an issue about, you know, sort of riot control weapons, whether they are properly regarded as outlawed under the convention or not. Mm. All I'm saying is there is an international norm of a great deal of force and conviction uh, which is out there on chemical weapons and a pretty good, by any account, verification system. Because most of this stuff can only be done by industrial scale applications and the system that now exists for keeping an eye on what major industry players are doing is pretty good. Um, but, you know, none of these things are totally foolproof. A lot of questions. Uh, we want to begin. Yeah? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a question for the German Minister of Defence. Uh, we, you mentioned that you were trying to avoid a nuclear arms race in the Middle East by stopping Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. But I think that's a bit misleading because clearly nuclear arms rates in the Middle East started when Israel acquired nuclear weapons, uh, roguely, basically. And the international community decided to ignore that completely and instead, instead of imposing sanctions, even increased military support, including Germany, of heavy weapons to Israel, as if Israel needed even more means to destroy its neighbors. Um, my question is, why has the international community, community decided to ignore what is clearly the biggest risk of nuclear escalation, at least in the region and in the world? Is it because of a certain guilt that will take you another 50 years to overcome? Well, that's um, a question I'll happily try and answer. What you're implying with your question is that a nuclear arms rate has already begun, initiated by Israel. Well, yes, is Iran is trying to get the weapon because of um, the fact that Israel has the weapon, but that's not the logic that I would follow. Iran isn't following that logic. Um, and if that were true, Egypt, true, Egypt Saudi Arabia, uh, other countries would already have the nuclear w weapon. So please think about this, because um, it's a very severe judgment. I'd like, to, yeah. I'd like to answer. I think you're very right. Where do you think, uh, where do you think that uh, uh, the funds came for Pakistan to acquire this nuclear uh, technology? You think Pakistan had the funds? I'm not, not going to name the countries, but they came from those countries that feared that Israel would have the weapon and they felt that Pakistan was fairly advanced in the development, so they did give them the funds. So in a way, they did, uh, Israel's uh, acquirement of nuclear weapons did uh, produce an arms race of sort, but not b between Israel and Pakistan, but in the region. Well, you could continue this debate um, for a long time. I don't think we should get bogged down um, if one feels that it's uh, right for Israel to be, to have nuclear arms, uh, then it should, they should state that they have them because they should um, formalize their position and commit themselves, if necessary, to uh, disarmament. But I think it's not very useful to look for the causes behind it. Uh, there are always supports for the armament and disarmament efforts of different states, um, including Israel, including Pakistan, as you've said. With regard to nuclear armament, you have to deal with the facts and then be able to respond to the facts. 
But the question that's been asked, says the moderator, is why do some countries have the right to have nuclear weapons and others not? That's the question. Well, as we've said, some countries clearly, and this even some represented on the podium, have simply grabbed the right for themselves and um, have got away with it so far, just to put things simply. Another question, yeah? Hello, I'm a student from the International School of Geneva, and I have a question for... Uh, a little bit louder, please, excuse me. We um, have difficulty to hear. I have a question for Ms. Evans. Yeah. Uh, you were talking earlier about um, that about the fact that one of the biggest... to, uh, to the, pr the uh, to proliferation, well, to non-proliferation, was the uh, uh, potential uh, capability of uh, non-state actors to obtain nuclear weapons. Uh, Yet the, the NNPT states quite clearly that uh, it has the right to obtain nuclear technology for peaceful means. And I was wondering how, how, it, how is it possible to reconcile uh, nuclear technology acquired for peaceful means and proliferation? Well, I mean, Mr. Evans. that's what the whole theory of the non-proliferation treaty is about, that parties to the treaty submit to inspections, monitoring, safeguards to ensure there will be no diversion of that material or technology to non-peaceful purposes. And that's what the whole argument, of course, has been about in Iran as to whether Iran has honoured that commitment under the treaty or has, in fact, breached it. But by and large, we've done, we've done pretty well um, over the years in terms of um, keeping the... <coughs> the, um, the non-weapon states have been the beneficiaries of technology and material um, honest in this respect. Um, the cases that have you know, gone wrong are the ones, that we, uh, the ones that we know about. But I think we can be, what we do have to do in the context of this forthcoming NPT review conference is to really work very hard to get agreement, <coughs> however, on strengthening some aspects of that regime. It badly needs strengthening. Um, in terms of stronger monitoring and verification mechanisms, a thing called the additional protocol, which everybody really must sign up to, which gives much more wide-ranging inspection powers. And there's also the need for tougher, tougher sanctions and provisions to deal with those countries that shelter under the legal protection of the NPT while acquiring the capability to walk away from it, thumbing their nose at everybody else seen that with North Korea, we may be seeing it with Iran at the moment, and there's a lot of deep unhappiness in the international community about that, and all these things are, are on the agenda. Um, the other thing that's on the agenda is the, the whole question of nuclear security and the control and locking down of weapons and materials, stockpiles and so on all around the world to ensure that we can <coughs> have higher confidence levels than now, that they won't be accessed by um, non-state actors, um, among others. <coughs> and that is exactly what this Obama nuclear summit is about in April. Uh, it's on these issues of nuclear security. And again, uh, from the Europeans and others, there's a very strong commitment to doing even more uh, than is up there at the moment to achieve that result. Herzog Gutenberg, to this Frage. Well, yes, I think I would uh, really underline that. It might be surprising, but uh, I, I agree on many, many points uh, with what Mr. Evans has been saying. The NPT system is in a crisis of credibility, and there is the opportunity now which has to be grasped, and it's necessary to pursue more international norms. Now, the question that's been asked from the floor is what about civil use? Well, I think the need for energy will increase and there will be a demand for nuclear energy. Now, whether you agree or not, many people are going to seek to do that. And there are free, of rather voluntary commitments, uh, such as the PSI initiatives, which are provided for in the treaties, um, which states can voluntarily participate in. That needs to be part of the legal structure, but there needs to be more efforts there. The review conference, first of all, needs to be a success, otherwise the whole system will collapse.
Ihre Frage, Sie, Sie haben lange yes, uh, you've waited a long time to ask your question. I'm uh, Tom Bomastic. I'm a German student in Austria, but I'm from the United States. And um, my question would mainly be for uh, Herr Verteidigungsminister uh, Gutenberg, but anybody else could answer as well. I spent seven and a half years in the United States uh, Navy, and we have one of the most uh, powerful nuclear arsenals on Earth. Um, what, uh, but we pretty much do what the civilians tell us to do. Uh, my question is, is it ever morally justified to use a nuclear weapon? And uh, if so, uh, what is your criteria for, do it, for making your decision? Is it a religious decision? Um, is it a political decision? What, what uh, defines your morality? That, uh, <laughs> Very big question. You, you, yeah, I put it. yeah, after you can answer. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, the perspective from a country which is not a nuclear power but which is part of an alliance which has um, nuclear weapons I have to say that I would have huge moral problems with the use of this weapon however I can accept uh, possessing such weapons as deterrents. Some things? Yes, I just want to add that when walking up, uh, Gareth Evans just informed me that he's about six months older than me. He's 65 and I'm going to be 65 in July. <laughs> but I fought two wars. And uh, when you fight a war, and I don't think many in this room have done, you see a lot of blood and gore and your friends dying around you. And you don't want to fight a war again. You don't want people to die. And uh, that is why I'm one of the greatest advocates of peace between India and Pakistan. And I do a lot in that respect. But if you want to talk about the morality of it, then I'll give you an answer which I gave to an Indian television many years ago. And he posed a question that we get there and we cut you off at this place. What will you do? I thought to some time and I said, we will use the nuclear weapon. If it is a question of our survival, then we have no choice. Right? So at that point of time, you have to question yourself whether you want to be extinct or be moral. Right? So I think at that point of time, you decide that you know, morality takes a back seat and survival takes the front seat. Can I? <laughs> the Christian tradition um, is clearly committed to the sanctity of human life, and anything that would destroy human life um, <coughs> of, or all forms of creation um, is something that cannot is something that would be condemned. Nuclear weapons violate those principles because they indiscriminately destroy human life as we know it. Um, churches are not alone in upholding the sanctity of human life. They're not the only ones. I mean, th this is something we see in all world religions. And the, the principle that Christian churches would use is do unto others what you would want others to do to you. You don't want others to use nuclear weapons against you, so why use it against the others? So we would use a totally, the, uh, totally opposite argument to... Um, but war destroy human life, life too. Pardon me. Yeah, correct, correct. And that's also on a moral... Uh, morally, that's also something... I, I want to... Answer that question. I was uh, uh, brought up in a convent as a Muslim, but I was brought up in a convent. And when I first went to war, and uh, my sister Leo, Mary Leo, whom I river among all other persons, and I've dedicated one of my books to her, sent a letter to me and said, All our lives we've taught you not to take human life, but you're fighting a war, and you've got to do your duty. And that she was, she was a Catholic nun. Can I just add one more, one more point to this? I think. If you accept the logic of nuclear deterrence, you're stuck in the position that has been articulated. You can't not be prepared to use nuclear weapons. I sat just last week in Atlanta with President Jimmy Carter when he was asked this question at a, a small conference. And he said, and Jimmy Carter, as you know, is the most morally complete <laughs> person you could possibly imagine. It was inconceivable to imagine him you know, being morally able to cause destruction on this scale by, by pressing the button. He said this was the hardest single dilemma. 
um, of his presidency because he knew he had the ultimate responsibility of pressing that button if the circumstances arose. And he knew that for deterrent credibility to be sustained against Russia, he had to be prepared to not only say that he'd press that button if there was an attack, but he had to be prepared to press the button. So he, he, he went through all the agonising stages of this logical dilemma and moral dilemma that you've articulated and came up with that result. And I don't think we can test that. But the further point I'd want to make is, for God's sake, don't let's accept at face value anymore the whole logic of nuclear deterrence. Certainly not as between the, the major nuclear armed states. I mean, there is, a, there is an issue for those states and Pakistan and Israel. Pakistan particularly is the classic example of a state that is subject to potentially overwhelming uh, conventional capability against it. But do we have to accept at face value the argument that a small number of nuclear weapons or capacity to wreak some havoc on the other side will work as a deterrent against conventional warfare? Do we have to accept the inexorable apparent logic of that? Or can we be just a little bit more confident in asserting that we are actually learning from the ravages of the past. There's not much to be gained by military action and warfare. And yeah, that yeah. maybe there are a few yeah, more, maybe, maybe, maybe really just maybe, people. there are a few more inhibitions operating out there uh, that will stop people using nuclear weapons, even if on the face of it, it seems to you be an existential to issue. Something? Remember that nuclear weapons were not used in Korea, not used in a whole variety of cases when they could have been in the past. And every decision maker has ever written about this, who was ever in these situations, they just said the notion of actually using nuclear weapons when it came to it. John Foster Dulles is on record as saying this, for God's sake. It's just the taboo is very intense. So, in is a sense, it's a little bit of a non-issue, but I, I do understand Ikram's dilemma, and we've got to be kind to him. Yeah, but the point, the point is, uh, Gareth, we estimated that the amount of nuclear weapons in India now, they'll kill us about five times over. So after the first time, you lose count how many times they'll kill you. You know, <laughs> So, you know, you stop worrying about it after the first time they kill you. Uh, you're waiting for your question. <laughs> Hello, my name is Valeria. My name is Valeria. I come from Germany. At the moment, I live in Liechtenstein. And I study there. Now, my question is that in the past, we knew that um, Iraq had uh, atomic weapons and they were destroyed. We knew from Iran, Pakistan, North Korea, that they were striving for nuclear armament. Um, they shouldn't be doing it. Well, so why haven't their bases been destroyed? Why on what is the military action taken to destroy them? <laughs> well, to date, I cannot give um, any proof that Iraq had uh, nuclear weapons or wanted to have nuclear weapons, that was um, justification which um, was used to certain ends and we are dealing with the results of um, those justifications today. And it's difficult, quite rightly, it's difficult. And when we look at the results of the actions that were taken, I would be extremely wary in using the same approach to other situations. And I believe that such an approach would simply lead to a conflagration. Mr. Evans. Well, I share that view absolutely. The whole variety of reasons. I mean, one, nobody can be sure precisely where facilities are located, what's buried under mountains and so on. And the notion that you could have a complete knocking out of Iranian capability through limited focused airstrikes is simply uh, nonsensical. Nobody's got that degree of confidence. The most you could almost certainly do would be to slow down the development of such a, a program for a significant period, two, three, four years, but in the scheme of things that's not all that significant. The um, second point to make is you would unquestionably be uniting the entire Iranian population against you. Whatever else we know about the different currents of opinion that are running in that country, we do know uh, that they are united um, in the sort of the pride factor about this thing, extraordinarily. But in the context of an external attack, this is just an absolute given. You'd have the entire nation up in arms. And thirdly, 
the consequences, I think, for the region and the wider international community would be devastating. We know a bit about how terrorist actors can be unleashed on the world. We know a bit about the sophistication of the country in question. And I think it would be so comprehensively counterproductive, it would be an act of lunacy to so act. At the same time, you've got to keep open the notion that should Iran actually acquire nuclear weapons and should there be credible evidence of some intent uh, to use them, of course you can't exclude then the possibility of a, uh, of a preemptive strike, um, even though, you know, again, the consequences would be pretty alarming. We have time for a, a last question. We want to... Yeah, please, Mr. My name is Fernando Roist, and I come from Switzerland. My question is to Mr. Evans and uh, Mr. Gutenberg. I think it's right to, to say that uh, scientists um, have led us to this pass, and scientists can perhaps save us from it. I think that the issue of energy is one of the key ones. Perhaps we could set a good example here. Germany has been a bit of a pioneer in renewable energies. Um, maybe if we went down that road, it would lead to a certain level of imitation. Now, Nobody has attacked Pakistan yet. Maybe Pakistan could also set an example. Um, say, we have acquired nuclear weapons, but we've become convinced of a new uh, view, namely that we are looking into the possibility of renewable energies, and we're looking for partners. And then you might find that a lot of people in the world will hear your voice. So the question of well, on the question of renewable energies, If we can do without uh, atomic energy and uh, replace that with renewable energy, then I would be the first person to support that and any means to achieve that objective. However, at the moment, our energy requirements cannot yet be covered without uh, the contribution of nuclear energy, nuclear power. And if we were to do away with it, uh, we'd be dependent on others until we could uh, provide, uh, cover our needs with um, renewable energy. Uh, maybe things like this need to be covered by conferences like Copenhagen. What I'm particularly impressed by, um, or what I've been particularly struck by over the last few months, was the, f was the failure in Copenhagen. That doesn't mean that we're going to give it up. What it means is we're going to need technologies which uh, make us dependent on others. We need a certain level of security, a high level of security, not complete energy security. Um, but that, those are factors that need to be taken into account in this process. Uh, a world without nuclear weapon is perhaps the, the most acute challenge given today to the international community. I think man can this debate. Well, I think this debate can be summarized in that way. And we can close with those words. Uh, so thank you very much to all of our panelists. We have Andrei Schneider, who's uh, the general director of the World Economic Forum, who's going to come up, and Thomas Vip, uh, who wish to say something. Mr. Schneider. Danke sehr. Thank you very much. On behalf of the SEK and the World Economic Forum. I'd like to thank all of the participants in the panel and also thank all of the people who've come this evening. Without you, uh, it wouldn't be so rich, uh, so multi-layered, so lively. I think uh, we've been really blessed with the people who've come, young, middle-aged and old, at all of our discussions. I think it was a really important contribution. Uh, Open Forum has been a success again this year. We hope to see you all again next year at the Open Forum. I hope we'll discuss more interesting issues and look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much and have a good evening. And thank you, Mr. Schneider and Thomas Vip, who is president of the Federation of Swiss Evangelical Churches. Mr. Vip, do you wish, do you wish to say anything? No, you don't want to say anything more.
Okay, you simply wanted to say thank you to everybody, and so will I. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you to you, and have a wonderful evening. Goodbye.